I had a grandfather who was very useful to me, my mother's grandfather, and he was a pioneer, and he came out to Iowa with no money but youth and health and took it away from the Indians. He fought in the Black Hawk. He was a captain in the Black Hawk Wars, and he, he stayed there, and he bought cheap land, and he, he, he was aggressive and intelligent and so forth, and eventually he was the richest man in the town and on the bank and, and, uh, and highly regarded in a huge family and a very happy life. And, and he had the attitude, having come out to Iowa when the land was not much more than a dollar an acre, and having stayed there until that black topsoil created a modern rich civilization and some of the best land in the world, his attitude was that in a favored life like his, when you were located in the right place, you just got a few opportunities if you lived to be about 90. And the, the trick in coming out well was seizing a few opportunities that were your fair share that came along when they did. And he told that story over and over again to the grandchildren hung around him all summer. And my mother, who had no interest in money, remembered the story and told it to me. But I'm not my mother's natural imitator. And I knew Grandpa Ingham was right. And so I always knew from the very first, when I was a little boy, that the opportunities that were important that were going to come to me were few. And that the trick was to prepare myself for seizing the few that came. This is not the attitude they have at a big investment counseling thing. They think if they study a million things, they can know a million things. And, that, and, of course, the result is almost nobody can outperform an index. Whereas I sit here with my Daily Journal stock, my Berkshire Hathaway stock, my holdings in Lilu's Asian fund, my Costco stock. And, of course, I'm outperforming everybody. And I'm 95 <laughs> years old. I, I frankly never have a transaction. And the answer is I'm right and they're wrong. And that's why it's worked for me and not for them. And you know, the question is, do you want to be more like me or more like them? <laughs> the, the idea of diversification makes sense to a point. If you don't know what you're doing and you want the standard result and not be embarrassed, well, of course, you can widely diversify. Now, you, nobody's entitled to a lot of money for recognizing that because it's a truism. It's like knowing that two and two equals four. And, but the investment professionals think they're helping you by arranging a dur dur diversification. An idiot could diversify a portfolio, and, or a computer, for that matter. And, and, but... The whole trick of the game is to have, have a few times when you know that something is better than average and uh, invest only where you have uh, that extra knowledge. And then if you get just a few opportunities, that's enough. Uh, what the hell does you care? You own three securities and J.P. Morgan Chase owns 100. You know, it, it's, what's wrong with owning a few securities? Warren always says if you lived in a growing town and you own stock in three of the best enterprises in the town. Isn't that diversified enough? The answer is, of course it is. They're all wonderful places. And that is, too, because you like stories. Here's an apocryphal story that is very instructive. A young man comes to visit Mozart. And he says, Mozart, he says, I want to write symphonies. And Mozart says, how old are you? And the man says, I'm 23. And Mozart says, you're too young to write symphonies. And he says, but Mozart, he says, you were writing symphonies when you were 10 years old. And Mozart says, yes, but I wasn't asking other people how to do it. <laughs> now there's another Mozart story. Here's the greatest musical talent maybe that ever lived. And what was his life like? Well, he was bitterly unhappy and he died young. That's the life of Mozart. What the hell did Mozart do to screw it up? Make himself, well, he did two things that are guaranteed to create a lot of misery. He overspent his income scrupulously. That's number one. That is really stupid. 
And the other thing was he was full of jealousies and resentments. If you'll spend, overspend your income and be full of jealousy and resentments, you can have a lousy, unhappy life and die young. All you've got to do is learn from Mozart. You can also learn from that young man who was asking Mozart how to write symphony. The truth of the matter is that not everybody can learn everything. Some people are way the hell better. And of course, no matter how hard you try, there's always some guy that achieves more, some guy or gal. And the my answer is, so what? Do it. Does any of us need to be the very top of the whole world? It's ridiculous. And another thing that people do that I regard as amazing is they build these enormous mausoleums. I think they figure they want people to walk by that mausoleum and say, gosh, I wish I were in there. <laughs> anyway. You can see we've had some fun as we go along. And it's worked so well, but if you actually figure out how many decisions were made in the history of the Daily Journal Corporation or the history of Berkshire Hathaway, it wasn't very many per year that were meaningful. It's a game of being there all the time and recognizing the rare opportunity when it comes and recognizing that a normal human allotment is to not have very many. Now, there's a very competent bunch of people who sell securities who act as though they've got an endless supply of wonderful opportunities. Well, those people are the equivalent of the racetrack tout. They're not even respectable. It's not a good way to live your life to pretend to know a lot of stuff you don't know and pretend to furnish you a lot of opportunities you're not furnishing. And my advice to you is avoid those people, but not if you're running a stock brokerage firm. You need them. But it's not the right way to make money. And, and, and this business of, of controlling the costs and living simply, and that was the secret. How much money? Warren and I had tiny little bits of money. We always underspent our incomes and we invested and we well, you know, if you live long enough, you end up rich. It's not very complicated. And, and now there is a part of life which is, how do you scramble out of your mistakes without them costing too much? And we've done some of that too. And if you look at Berkshire Hathaway, think of its founding businesses, a doomed department store, a doomed New England textile company, the Doom Trading Stamp Company. Out of that came Berkshire Hathaway. Now, we handled those losing hands pretty well, and we bought into them very cheaply. But of course, the success came from changing our ways and getting into the better businesses. And it isn't that we were so good at doing things that were difficult. We were good at avoiding things that were difficult. Hello, Mr. Munger. I'm on your right. Uh, you, you speak about the importance of fishing in uh, waters with ample fish. Uh, if you were starting out today, what you know sea uh, would you be fishing in, uh, other than in China, of course? Well, other than China, but if there's one good place in the world, that's more than my share. There are others, I'm sure. But it's hard for me to believe that anything could be better for the mongers than China. Because I can't help you. I've solved my problem. You'll have to solve yours. <laughs> By the way, the water is fine in China. And some very smart people are wading in. And in due course, I think more will wade in. The great companies of China are cheaper than the great companies in the United States. Hi, Mr. Munger. Mm -hmm. My friend, uh, Mikel, and I were from Barcelona. And I have a question for you regarding uh, long-term investment and compound interest. So I try to remember if it was you or Einstein that said that compound interest was the strongest force on Earth. 
And in the last few years, with the very low interest rates out there, it's been difficult to find opportunities for having a long-term compound interest-based strategy. So beyond investing in Berkshire, value investing, or index funding, where would you invite us to find um, opportunities for long-term investment where compound interest is really that worse? Well, my advice for a seeker of compound interest that works ideally is to reduce your expectations because I think it's going to be tougher for a while. And it helps to have realistic expectations, makes you less crazy. And but I think that... You know, they say that common stocks, from the aftermath of the Great Depression, which was the worst in the English-speaking world in hundreds of years, to the present time, maybe an index has produced 10%, but that's pre-inflation. After inflation, it may be 7% or something. And there's been 7 and 10 in terms of its consequences are just hugely dramatic over that long period of time. And if that seven in real terms that may have been achieved starting in a perfect period through the greatest boom in history, starting now, it could well be 3% or 2% in real terms. I mean, it's not unthinkable you'd have 5% returns and 3% inflation or some ghastly consequences like that. And so the ideal way to cope with that is to say if it handles, if that happens, I can have a happy life. Because why shouldn't you be happy in spite of the fact that the civilization wasn't quite as easy as it was for my generation? And now beyond that, when it gets more difficult, how should you do it? Well, the answer is because it's going to be very difficult, you should work at it. And if all that gets you is 6% for a lifetime of work instead of 5 you should be cheerful about it. If you want to hit it out of the park easily, you should talk to Jim Cramer. <laughs> Hi, Charlie. My name is Julia LaRoche. Uh, last year, we saw a record amount of share repurchases, and now we're hearing rhetoric out of Washington, D.C., specifically legislation to curb uh, stock buybacks. What's your take on stock buybacks, and do you think politicians should be telling companies what to do? Thank you so much. Well, generally speaking, I'm restrained in my enthusiasm for politicians telling corporations what they should do. But I will say this. When it was a very good idea for companies to buy back their stock, they didn't do very much. And when the stock's got so high priced that it's frequently a bad idea, they're doing a lot. Welcome to adult life. <laughs> this is the way it is. But it's questionable at the present levels whether a lot of it is smart. Was Eddie Lambert smart to buy back so much shares of Roebuck? No. And a lot of, there's a lot of that kind of mistake that's been made.